So, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today on this webinar discussing uh, go-to-market strategies, how to get the most out of your trips to market, out of your buying activities. Um, so I'm Mike Alec, president of Management One, and we are lucky today because we have four experts on the retailer vendor or retailer brand, whatever you want to call it, on that relationship, that key relationship that keeps the right products in your stores. So we have Kelly Helfman, the president of Informa Markets Fashion, um, you know, who runs uh, the Magic Show, the Coterie Show's project, um, and has been in the business of connecting brands and retailers for, for, for many years now. Um, we have Doug Hilfiker, who is um, a retail expert with the Management One and one of our leading retail experts, services lots of great retailers um, and has really helped retailers with their buying and inventory management management and inventory planning for many years, but also um, has represented brands through his activities as uh, running a showroom. So he really sees both sides of the equation. And then Samantha Connor, who is with the Boutique Hub, their director of wholesale, and specifically runs uh, their new great online platform, Hubventory, again, all about connecting uh, brands and retailers. Um, and finally, uh, to moderate this panel, we have our own Dane Cohen, who's our director of business development. And uh, Dane has a background in uh, family-owned retail, uh, but has also been in sales for uh, several uh, leading brands, including uh, Helmut Lang and uh, in theory. And so he, again, he's, he's seen both sides of the picture and can talk knowledgeably about, uh, about that key retailer brand relationship. So, um, so Dane, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let's kick it off. And, and Mike, don't forget, I started in the trenches with you at the trade show. So that was where I, that's where I got my start. So that is true. Have, that is true. We know the trade show world well um, and the trade events, but I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, and some of my favorite people are on this panel. So it's good to see everyone. Uh, and, and really, I think that, you know, we, we're in market time and people are, are traveling and retailers are, are starting to really plan their their seasons ahead. And so I think it's always great to just have a level set conversation, one about so, just some, you know, always timeless strategies for when we're going into events, but really catering it to what's happening right now. What's the overall um, kind of vibe out there in the retail industry and how retailers can adapt to what's going on uh, in the current climate. So Samantha, I want to kick off with you. And that is because you are actually sitting at market right now. You're in Dallas, if I'm correct. Yeah. Uh, at the boutique hub showroom. So, you know, here's one, one, the first question I have for you, you know, one of the things that I'm noticing when I'm at events is I could be at an event one month and retailers are flying high. They think they're on top of the world. Everything's great. We're selling, selling, selling. And the next month it's doom and gloom. And I think that's, sometimes common with retailers, but it seems to be very, um, you know, more kind of back and forth than ever. What's the climate on the ground now? How are retailers feeling about the current uh, future outside? Yeah, well, I'll have to tell you. So at Dallas Market is the home and gift week, and then next week it moves into apparel. So um, sometimes I will do a litmus test of how is market going by the parking. So when the parking lot's really full, then that's a good sign. There's a lot of buyers there. And so I will tell you, the parking is overcrowded. So this is good. Um, energy is high. I think we're you know, getting ready to head into holiday season. So uh, retailers are feeling um, positive and I think they're feeling hopeful, uh, which is something we you know, maybe haven't seen in a while. Um, they know that there's many people that are looking to buy gifts, looking to buy things for family members, um, holidays for apparel. You've got all those special occasions um, and those things coming. So um, the vibe on the floor is very good. I'm very excited about that. Um, the buzz is good, but they're also, you know, they're having to make some smart decisions. They want to know, what should I buy? I'm hearing that a lot. What should I be buying? Yeah. Um, that's, that's always the question, right? And so Kelly, uh, by the way, I just want to put it out to all our attendees, uh, feel free to jump in with questions, write them in as we're talking about topics. We'll try to get to them, uh, at the end, but, uh, you know, Kelly, I do want to jump in and bring you into, into the conversation. So, you know, listen, we're, we're now three years out plus uh, post that first, you know, January, uh, March 2020, which seems crazy how far, how far we've come. And there's been a lot of shifts in the industry since then, especially uh, with trade events. You know, so how have things kind of leveled out now? You know, I think we're kind of level set and I think business is kind of the supply chains are getting back to business as usual. 
Uh, we see sales kind of starting to become a little bit more stable and predictable. How has it really impacted trade events and, you know, what's going on in commerce on the floor? Yeah, no, I mean, it was really difficult to be in the events business during the pandemic and then be able to come back. It has taken us a while to get back to those pre-pandemic uh, numbers in terms of size of our brand, size of our show. We wanted to make sure that we were really intentional when coming back to market and how we did that to address all the changes that had happened in the industry. So overall, um, the shows, Coterie, Magic, we're really at project and even sourcing. We're coming back strong. We're about at those pre-pandemic numbers with site, uh, amount of brands that are doing the show. It's just how they show up, these brands, is a little bit different. So maybe they take a smaller booth and they're doing a more curated collection instead of bringing 10 sets of every single sample. Um, they're smarter because they are still making up from that lost revenue that they had during the pandemic, right? And so they're very strategic also, these brands, on what they're launching at Magic, for example. So a lot of our brands say at Magic and Project in Las Vegas twice a year, this is when we're going to launch and kick off these new seasons. So they have exclusives. They're very intentional about the exclusives that they have at the different shows. Um, you know, Coterie is coming back a lot stronger than ever. I think that New York's really special and we've seen the New York Fashion Weeks also get stronger post pandemic. So it's interesting to see the different regions. I do think that these retailers and probably everybody agrees are being more strategic on what shows they need to go to as retailers are watching their budgets and have to make sure that, you know, maybe back in the day they would go to all regional markets and every single magic and every single New York coterie. But now it's really understanding what's needed, thinking about how they shop. And I think it's a good thing. Like we had to get a little bit more strategic and intentional on how we were going to do our buying. And it's the same on the brand side. Do I have to do all five markets? Do I have to do all that? How does my customer need to shop? How can I communicate with them in between these markets and so forth? And so We've now bubbled up those conversations and we're being very consultative with our brands and our retailers on what are your goals? What are you looking to do? What's your distribution? And let me then map out what shows we recommend for you to go to. So that's important. Um, and also to Samantha's point, it's about helping them on what they should buy, how they should buy differently post pandemic with how things are changing and the consumers are shopping differently. So doing a ton of education on, you know, free trend reports and giving them all that content because that helps save bucks. Um, and also, you know, just ongoing help supporting marketing and how they can get more eyeballs to their sites and into their stores. Yeah, and I think that that, you know, the, the, I love the intentionality of it, right? Because that, that kind of matches up so beautifully with our message here at Management One, which has always been, you know, stop winging it when you go into market. And listen, of course, there's a time and a place that we want to go in and we want to have fun and we want to explore and we want to connect. Um, but because we maybe need to be more intentional with what markets we're attending, how we're buying, so too must our trips, right? We need to, you know, get to work and really use the, use your data and use what's, what your business is telling you in order to make decisions at market. So Doug, uh, you work with a lot of clients directly, they're going to market. And, and, and I really want to get from you a sense of, you know, what should be in a retailer's toolkit when they're walking into market, whether that be reports, data, obviously as a management one uh, retail expert, you know, I, I would hope you would say your, your plans, right? Um, but what should they really be going in from a mindset and actual tool perspective? You know, the reality is that the information that they could get the most from is is in the open to buy report. The plan on demand, the plan on demand, the most recent plan on demand is what gets them the most information. Um, but I, I always feel like that gives them a picture of what to do. But really, they need their point of sale system to go through. I, it's one of the pre planning for markets for retailers is they're horrible at that for the most part. Like. Sell, running selling reports for if you're going to buy a spring season, you should run a selling report for your spring. You should know what your vendors did last spring season. Um, 
it, it gives you, whenever I went to market and I, the first thing I would do with a rep or a vendor is I would pull out their selling report from last year. And it's very, it, it like takes them back because most of them don't know, most uh, wholesalers don't know a, a thing about retail. Um, so the fact that you're going into that aggressive, kind of showing them like, hey, I'm not just another schmuck that's here to give you my credit card and buy some stuff. Like I'm running a business here. Um, so, um, and so that, that's a really important thing. And if you're, if they're on, you know, if they're on the internet with their point of sale system, they can, you know, they can pull up their selling for the last month for the vendor. And it really, I think, sets them apart as retailers. And it, I would tell you it's a 1% or 2% of the retailers that even do anything that approaches that. Uh, but that pre-planning for market is super, super important. Yeah, and what, what's so interesting about that, and I, I find I have this conversation time and time again at market, at events, it, it's like the retailer has power in this relationship, right? They're the customer, they're going in to buy. And I think sometimes it could feel intimidating when you're walking into a booth and the, you know, the vendor or the brand has the presence and that you feel like they're kind of like this, you know, this big presence at the show, but you are the, you're, you're the most important person there. Right. You are the end stop for this product. Uh, you are the customer at the end of the day. And I think, um, you know, Samantha, Kelly, I, I'll kind of throw it out to both of you. What are some tips that you would give to retailers to one, cultivate these relationships and two, for lack of a better way of saying it, kind of stand their ground, right? And, and feel power in their position as a retailer attending a trade event. I'll start. I, I think it's important to make sure that the brand is the right fit for you as well. So it's often I'll give the advice to brands like make sure you talk to that retailer. It makes sense for you. What brands are they carrying? Like, is it the type of distribution that you want, et cetera? But I think it's super important for the retailer to ask the same questions and make sure that that brand portrays, uh, you know, the kind of business that they want to be doing with their consumers, right? So who are they selling to currently? Make sure that if you have a brick and mortar, they're not selling to too many people in the same region. You need to interview them. Um, ask how long they've been around, how long they've been at shows, is there, you know, how new they are. What it's really important that you ask the questions and don't just shop the product because some of these brands are super new and you need to make sure that they're set up for success and they're going to follow through and all the things. So it's an interview process. Um, often I do tell brands that it takes a couple shows for the retailers really to build that trust and to feel comfortable and come back show after show for those orders. So I think um, it's also okay as a retailer to make note and order after the show. So take notes, take pictures of what you like, shop the entire show and then go back and then decide who you want to write with and think on it a little bit. Um, that's great. Ask them about their options. Are they open to drop shipping? Are they open? You know, so you kind of have to create a list of questions to go in and make sure that they're the right fit for you too um, at the end of the day. And of course, the benefit of coming to these shows is really seeing the quality, touching, feeling the product, and there's nothing like it. And understanding how they'll work with you differently, maybe to set that relationship apart versus some of their other retailers. Hey, yeah. Dan, real, sorry, really quick. Can I can I ask, can I add two specific questions that you should, they should always ask to a new vendor? Please. <laughs> Do you sell direct to consumer and what's your retail markup on your, on your, um, when you're doing that? That's, because like you can rule out half of the people you're talking to when they say, well, we do it, we double our, you know, we double our cost. It's like, you you don't want to be do you don't want to be going into a new vendor with it gets going to give you a 50% markup. Yeah, they're going to price, that. your consumers are going to price compare and you need to make sure that if they have a D to C uh, business that you're competitive with that and you really need to understand. Absolutely, Doug. And, and I'll add one more. What's your markdown cadence, right? Because you don't want to be stuck with a D to C brand who's marking up only 50% and is taking markdowns all the time and you're never going to be able to really you know, make any margin on this brand, you're always going to be competing against them. So that that's great. And I think that Kelly, you know, that list of questions, you know, walking in and, and having, you know, what are your ship dates? How do you, do you have any show discounts, right? All of those preparation that's going to 
you know, really make you walk into a, a vendor's booth and, you know, you're going to knock them off their socks a little bit because they're going to be taking a little bit of back. I think that's a good thing. Keep them on their toes. Yeah, for right. sure. And all this is about, you know, building relationships, really. And it's that start that conversation. Who's the decision maker at this booth? Who's the decision maker for this brand? And then introduce yourself. And then that's when you can hit those questions. And really, if they're smart, they want to grow with you. Um, they want to see you succeed. They don't care just about that sell and they want the sell through. And so creating that relationship will help that happen. Yeah. And Samantha, you know, you, we were talking a little bit before the um, before we went live about how retailers could actually extend the relationship beyond just the events, right? And I think that, you know, part of what um, you and your team at Hubventory have done is kind of extend that. And I think that there was a feeling at a certain time that there was almost a competition between the online marketplaces and, you know, the online wholesale marketplaces and the actual events. But I think you view that differently if you could share kind of how you view the the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I would say being at market and, you know, going to magic and going to all these, mar you know, markets, nothing will ever replace the in-person experience. Um, you know, no matter how good a product description is, you don't know that how rigid that denim is, how stretchy that is until you get over there and you feel it, you touch it. Everything looks great in a picture. We all know that. Um, that all looks good online, but you really need to make that relationship. So what I like to do, you know, or suggest people do with Hubventory is um, either use it as a pre-market tool. Um, we have trade show calendars on there so you can see who's going to be exhibiting at Magic. Um, who could I meet there possibly? Make a list and then go in and like said, Kelly said, do your interview, do all that. But this kind of helps you um, make that shopping list before you go. And then also um, to continue that relationship and things in between markets. Um, it helps those brands because they are getting customer acquisition. They're um, getting in front of retailers that may not know them. Um, so they're getting that exposure. But for you retailers, um, it helps you in between the show. If, if you need to do a reorder or you're looking for something um, that you want to get in in between the shows, it, it's, an, it's a supplement to it. Um, but I encourage everybody to go to the shows, see the brands, make that relationship, touch the clothes. I always say also, don't take it personal if the brand interviews you as well, because they're making sure that you're as a retail retailer, the right fit for them. And then, and you carry brands that they want to hang with at retail. So never take it personally. It's really important that the brands are doing that as well to make sure you guys are a good fit for each other. Um, also to Samantha's point, use the tools we have because pre-show up until, you know, a month to the show, you can go on Hub has it, but you can also go on Magic or Coterie or Project websites, and it has every single brand. It has the products they carry. So if you're looking for women's dresses, everybody comes up, footwear, et cetera, and you can really map out the people you want to see. Um, like Coterie, you really need to make appointments. Magic, you could pretty much just walk in and that's okay. But always leave time to just walk the floor and find new. That's why you're there, right? That's what sets you apart. You can go see the brands you know and love and always work with. But what's going to set you apart from the retailer down the road is that you're going to discover new that maybe they didn't because they didn't go to the show. So give your time, give yourself that time. Um, ask what are the exclusives at Magic or at Coterie or any of the shows that I can only buy here. That's also a different product that you would have from other people. So that that's the advantage. But you can do a lot of that pre-planning. And then, of course, like making sure Dana always speaks at our shows, right? Like you also mark all that free, amazing education that you're going to get only on site at the shows. So you can plan it accordingly to say, you know, I can go listen to Dane, give this great presentation, to help my business and Kelly's trend, uh, you know, conversation. Then I could go shop for a while, then leave time for new. Oh, and by the way, go see Ludacris. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, Work hard. We're, play hard. Big name. I like this, Kelly. I'm excited. I'm excited for this. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, Ludacris will be performing uh, in Vegas at Market coming up in August. So uh, very excited about that. Doug, I, we actually have a question that came in uh, that I want you to take. And we're, you know, Kelly just you know, ended up talking about going out and discovering new product, right? And leaving some time for that. And I think that's always a constant question. You know, how much do I go back to the well of the legacy brands that have worked for me versus new? And Tom Moore uh, wrote in, we've been looking to reduce the number of vendors. So we are looking at the vendors that uh, do not turn a good margin for us. So that's a great way maybe to weed out some vendors that haven't been working for you. But we don't also want to become over-reliant on just what we've always 
had. So how do we find some new? And you had a great perspective on this that I'd love you to to share well, with everyone on new. Well, and, and and so yeah, thanks, Dane. I'll I'll definitely share that. But I what one of the things I want to uh, remind everybody as, as a retailer going to market, remember these are all salespeople. Their job is to sell you, right? Mm -hmm. They're not your friends. They're that you might have a few friends after a number of years if you've been through some difficult things and find out who's going to help you when you have a problem and you're not just uh, giving them another order. Uh, but just remember, you are being sold stuff. So you're the customer. Um, trust, like test, but verify, right? You. You don't go crazy with anything you see for the first time. Give them a test order. See how happy they are to test something. And if they're not happy to give you a test order, then you really need to think about whether you need to do it. But I think, Dane, what you were talking about is like, uh, make sure at market you go in a lot of places that you, you would normally overlook. Like look for the very small booths because that might be a new company with a new owner that just got into the business, you might be able to get exclusives from them. Um, it, it is still an item business. So you could go into a booth and find two items of from a thousand things that could turn out to be your next best thing. So do not, like it's a needle in a haystack thing. Remember, you need to, you need to sort, you need to kiss a whole lot of frogs to find a prince. Um, so do a lot of kissing at market and finding a lot of, Go in a show. Go in showrooms. You like that? Like maybe are too ostentatious, and tell them you need to just look around. Like you do not need to. You need to take control of your business and your time. If if you go to a showroom and they want to sit you down and and look through and show you everything, say you know what? I don't have the time to do that right now. You're not being impolite by saying I have to value my time. Can I come back at the end of the day and look through some of the stuff you have? Because um, some people want you to sit down and they want to walk you through everything. And that's fine if you know and you have the time. But if you don't have the time, you need to guard your time and make sure you you don't get caught in somebody that that's a waste of your time. Yeah. And, and speaking of Misty uh, in the Q&A, uh, Kelly, you were talking about some appointments. Uh, Misty writes, can you make appointment with, with brands you aren't sure if you will buy from? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they don't expect for you to necessarily write an order. So tons of people make an appointment, come look, shop and say, you know, I'll circle back. I'm going to kind of go back home and decide what I'm going to buy. And then you can buy later. No problem. That's always expected. So the whole point is to shop. I mean, they, of course, they love an order, but there's never guarantees. So set those appointments and you do not have to. All right, great. And Samantha, you know, one of the things that I, I really have found interesting, and I've, you know, at, at Boutique Hub Summit and, and, and anytime I'm talking with our Boutique Hub retailers, there's really a community around, you know, what brands have worked for, you know, your, your Boutique Hub uh, members, right? And so can you talk a little bit about how you view the vetting process? Because I know that there are some uh, brands out there that, you know, boutique hub members say, oh, they ship on time. They're wonderful. The product's great quality. And that's almost a, a great way to really vet the brands out there. So how do, how do you guys think about the vetting process, so to speak? Yeah, I think that's so important, um, you know, to know who it is that you're buying from. Um, so any um, brand that applies to be part of the boutique hub um, they do go through a vetting process that includes, you know, how long have you been in business? Where do you sell? What are your price points? Um, sharing line sheets, um, you know, looking at their social media, looking at, you know, their, their e-commerce site, um, that part. And then the other part, which I think is so strong about our community is like what you said, what are the people saying about this brand? Um, you know, and so we'll go through our Facebook groups and um, retailers are not shy about talking about when they have a bad experience. Um, so they'll share that information and they're equally as kind when they have a good experience. So um, I think that is just something that kind of gives you that trust factor um, as a boutique Hub member is knowing, OK, if I see this brand um, and they've got that pink circle on it at market uh, or they're on Hubventory, I know that there's been a vetting process. Um, and when there are issues, um, we do have a complaints form, you know, and they can fill that out. And we look into each and every one of those. And obviously, if several of those build up, then uh, that trust is broken and the, the partnership ends there so um but it, it it gives you that that safe hold of like okay boutique hub told me that this is a good brand and the other people are working with them as well chances are that relationship is in going to be in a good spot 
Mm. That's great. That's great yeah. uh, insight. So we have another question that came in. Do I have to? I, I, I love this question because I, I have an opinion here, but I'm, I want to see what Kelly and then Doug has to say. Do I have to leave my order at the show or is it OK to take it back to the store and make sure I'm on budget? But I think this question comes up a lot like and Doug, you kind of hit it. You are working with salespeople, right? They're trying to sell you. So Kelly, I'll let you crack this one first. Should people be, you know, is it more of a looking event? Should people be writing paper? How do you balance that? Oh. I think you're on mute, Kelly. Sorry. I don't know what happened to the sound. No. Uh oh. All right. Well, well, we're fixing your mic issues, Doug. Um, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. And Kelly just tried to jump in if you can. What, it, what advantage is it to you to leave the order at market? Are you? Is this a new vendor that you want to make sure you lock up? Um, that might be something. That might be a reason to leave an order. Are they offering some kind of a market incentive? Um, that might be a reason to to leave an order. Is it a reorder of something that they have in stock? that you can react to at market, that would be a reason to leave it order. But there's no reason. The, the one thing you need to understand is you, you'll you build up credibility with vendors when they try to get an order out of you and then you go home and, and get them an order in a very timely manner um, so that they know when they work with you, the most frustrating thing for a, a, a rep or somebody that uh, works with a brand is to work with somebody continually and you're not seeing any paper from them. Like that's a really good way to alienate um, uh, a brand, you know, a brand or a rep or whatever. So, like, take do do com communicate very clearly about what your intention is. I plan on taking this home. I write my orders within a week after I've analyzed my budgets and got them. You you can follow up with me in a week if you haven't heard from me, and I will tell you where I'm at. Um, you just need to be really clear. Thanks for your time today. Um, this is one of the new vendors that I'm thinking about and considering. Um, I, you know, if you if you don't hear from me in a week, you can get back in touch with me, and I'll tell you kind of where I am in the process. Um, this order is going to be really much bigger than I thought it was going to be, so I need a little time to process it. But you will be getting an order from me. Like you just need to have a very clear expectation of what they can they can expect from you. Jane, can you hear me okay? We got yeah. you. Okay, cool. I think it said host unmuted you. So I'm I'm back in business. Um one other thing, Doug, you said it all would be they don't like when you're an order canceller. So it's better to know you want to uh, move forward with an order because if you keep making orders and canceling, that's really hard too. So often they'll really ask for that deposit or want to figure out something financial to lock you in because they'll often, if they don't have immediate goods, they'll produce, assuming that order is coming in and then you cancel. And that's when they get stuck with extra inventory and it's really upsetting for them. So you have to understand that, that if you're going to cancel, that's going to create a bad relationship. And the same way boutique and, and retailers talk, brands talk. Oh, that buyer, they always cancel or they, they don't pay They're you know, on time. Like, so it's a thing you want to make sure that you're really ready. Yeah. I, I think being respectful is really important. I think what, one of the things that has changed, you know, post COVID is I do think that uh, vendors are getting much tighter with ordering, right? So they're not they're not holding as much inventory as they used to. They're trying to run a leaner business. So if you don't write that order where maybe you used to have a little more time, maybe you could expect that they'd have some extra and some immediates. You know, I do think there is something to be said about you want to place your order and secure your goods, especially if this is a vendor or product that you really need uh, in, in your business. And the one other thing I just wanted to mention uh, on show specials, and Samantha, if you have any uh, uh, opinion on this, is you know if you get a show special and you're buying in bulk or buying, you still have to make sure you need that product, right? It's like if I go to the supermarket and it's buy four cartons of eggs for the price of you know for half off, but I don't need four cartons of eggs. They're just going to sit there and collect, you know, take up space in my refrigerator when I don't eat that many eggs or don't need that many eggs. 
So I think it's really important that we kind of stay grounded at market. And sure, if you have a great vendor and, and spending some extra dollars is going to push you over to free shipping, yes, do it. But you also want to be careful that you're not just kind of getting high on the deal and really not looking at, well, do I actually need this product? So uh, Sam, I'm sure you, you're seeing show specials all the time. What, what are you seeing out there? Yeah. So yeah, today just walking the floor. That's what's you have a show special. Here's my show special. Say exactly what you're talking about. Um, and it is. If you don't need it, you don't need it. Doesn't matter what the special is. Um, if that's not a product that you can sell, um, don't bring it into your store, um, no matter how good the deal is. Um, but I do think like um it goes back to once again the relationship and you are going to be sold, but if you can build the relationship with these brands. Um, I just really emphasize doing that because they're not going to try, if it's a brand new relationship, with, they're not going to try to push product on you that they know you can't sell um, because that won't cultivate uh, a long-term partnership. And that's really what you're looking for. And, and I will say this, being someone, and Doug, I'm sure you could relate to this, being someone who worked on the uh, as a wholesaler on that, on that side of the business, um, I would help the people who were, you know, great to work with. Right. So if someone needed a, a swap, right. And I could get them back into, or I could get them back into some product, you know, sometimes I'm going to honor the people that have just been really kind to me over the years. And we've worked well together and they do place their orders on time. Even if there's a business that maybe is a little bit more successful, right. Sometimes I want to give it to the good guys. So those relationships do matter. And uh, Tom Moore just uh, uh, wanted to point out he he wrote another great tip. Also, ask if they can return or swap product that doesn't move. That's another great question. How do you work with your retailers in season? So great, great point, Tom. Um, Kelly, I'm going to throw a question to you from Amy Lively at Magic. I often find that buying in bulk on jewelry and accessory items. Uh, I always work with the booth manager, manager to get price breaks. Uh, how, are clothing manufacturers doing this as well? Or is that something that's just in the accessory world? No, absolutely. They will. So it's worth to ask. Um, some of them are more open to it, especially the ones in West Hall and Magic, not as much in North Hall and the Project Show. Absolutely ask. Uh, a lot of it will be dependent on if it's just extra inventory because it's different than accessories, right? So, um, but worth it, especially in the trend section, less in the young contemporary or modern sportswear section. I always, I always say, Bain, Dane, if you don't ask, you don't get. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Like, can I have free shipping today if I leave you my order? Um, could, you know, if this thing doesn't work out, can I swap it as long as I get back in touch with you in two weeks from when I have it? Like, all they can do is say no, but you'd be surprised how many people want to say yes if you like put yourself out there. I just um, this is a personal anecdote, but I always find that my whenever I'm shopping or at a street fair or even a retail store, I'll always ask, you know, do you offer any discounts? Do you have anything going on? Could you do anything better on the price? And my friends always have to like walk away and hide. But if you don't ask, you don't get, I love that, Doug. Hey, Boutique Hub, uh, Informa, do you guys have any list of great questions uh, to bring into market? Do you, if there's any resources out there that you could share with our community, we'll link up with you and try to get that out. But um, You know I'm we do. We've got the education part taken care of. Uh, you know, um, I always think of Sarah Burks, and when she picks up something, she doesn't say, how much does this cost? She says, how much can I sell this for? Um, so simple things like that on um, really looking at you're investing in inventory, you're not buying cute clothes. So um, we've got a whole you know, Q and A list of that um, and even organizing what brands have done well for me. Like you guys said, pull that POS, um, make sure you know before you go. So yeah, we'd be happy to share that with you guys. Great, that would be great. And for the shows, if you're a first time at any of our shows, whether it's Las Vegas, New York, Nashville, um, we do a no before you go. It's always on social media or a webinar. So if you're signed up as a registered buyer, you will get the link to join our no before you go, where we really give all those tips and tricks like this. You could ask specific questions if we didn't cover it. Um, and at magic, I always do a, a panel right at 10 AM or 9 AM on opening day where it's like how to shop the show 101. And we'll go over how to, you know, find specific booths, what 
if events are going on, how you shop it, what you ask. So make sure you look at all the educational content that happens at Magic or Coterie or Project because we're doing like how to shop the show one on 101 and we'll give you all that insight. Um, and of course, there's a ton of resources online at Magic Fashion Events and also our um, social channels for first time buyers. So we're constantly wanting to help you. We have a retail relations team and their whole job is to help you, the buyer, be able to have a great experience. So they're like your personal concierge consultant that could help hold your hand through this process. Because often, you know, the benefit of coming to like a magic marketplace is you can shop all price points, men's, women's, kids, footwear, apparel, accessories, gift, all in one area, right? And so it's such a good use of your money to get your ROI. The flip side is I get that could feel a little bit overwhelming. So we can very specifically tell you based on your needs exactly where to shop and go so you don't feel overwhelmed. Um, and that's what we're able to do in retail relations or I can help you at any point to say, oh, this is the type of price point. I'm looking for footwear and accessories. You need to go to just this hall and spend your two days there. Yeah, and I think Kelly, that that that's such a good point. And I think there, I, I think as I've seen Market Evolve over the years, I think there's much been a much more community minded focus. Um, but I think there's still a lot of retailers out there that feel like, hey, you know, I'm just running in, I'm doing this by myself. And there are so many resources. Why not take advantage? Whether it be the retail relationship uh, relations team, whether it be if you're a member of the boutique. I, I mean. Um, Samantha, I know, will, will you be at um, Market in August? Will you be at Magic? Yes, or, but I got to see Ludacris. So of course I'm coming. <laughs> yes, right. you'll be there. And we, you know, we give our vendor or we give our boutiques a list of brands to shop with that are vetted. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of support that goes into that. Right. So you have these resources, you have community. And I, I really do believe in that at, the more I've gone to markets and, and, educational events, there's really so much to gain outside of just that, the buying and the commerce part of it, and, and really lean into some of those educational programming. Shout out to me, I'll be speaking at market, so a little shameless plug. Um, but uh, I really do think there's some really powerful um, outside of just the one-on-one the -on -one commerce. So um, I'm going to take some questions. I see some questions are pouring in. We love to see the uh, participation. So uh, I will throw these out and try to direct them to who I think may be the, the best person, but I don't think they changed, don't want to put, right. So this is a, a great question. I think we have two questions about canceling orders. Um, so what is the etiquette around that? Uh, Doug, I think you probably would be able to, to kind of speak to that. When is it, you know, appropriate to cancel an order? Uh, both before it ships or, you know, when, when is when is that appropriate? Well, if you if you feel <clears throat> the canceling of orders is 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 the least fun thing that there is to do in retail. It's like you're becoming the worst customer that walked in your door uh, in the last month. So you need to you need to remember that. Um, so if you're going to cancel order or if you feel like you need to cancel an order as soon as possible is the best time to do it. The, the longer they have to deal with that, um, and then every company handles that differently. Some of them are going to threaten you with their lawyer saying, you know, you signed a sales contract, we cut this stuff special for you. Um, they usually, they, you know, they usually have a first line of contact with your customer sales, per, the salesperson, whatever, whoever you're calling in to cancel an order. Um, and so they're going to tell you that. And uh, I would say that 80% of people like, oh, I've got to take this. I can't cancel this. But the reality is, if it's something you really need to cancel, you need to push through on it. So you probably need to make a phone call, send an email, send a fax, and make sure you communicate in every way possible that you, you plan to cancel this order and you won't be receiving it. So that way you'll have their attention and then you'll put it in their court, um, so to speak, because they're, nobody likes to take an order cancellation and they're gonna, most of that, most, most companies are gonna fight you on it, which is why you have to be really strategic about the orders that you, that you are placing because it's, it's the least fun part of the business. Yeah, and uh, uh, just a little tool that I think is a, a great tool to kind of 
um, you know, prevent that so that you're tracking what you're buying in market. Um, they're a partner of boutiques and hub as well, Faves. It's an incredible app that you can really track what you're buying and noting at market. So Ula, I don't know if you're on the uh, the webinar today. Ula is the founder of Faves, but it really is a great tool. You could go, you could take pictures, you could take notes, you could kind of keep track so you can make sure you're not over assorting and buying you know, multiples of the same types of items. So that's a great way to sort out what you're buying at market. So even if you need to tell someone, hey, I need a week before I write that order, you have some buffer room to really see what you took notes on. Um, and then one more question I got about order cancellations uh, was what if they ship outside of the window? I really think that this is an easy tip for everyone. You should have firm ship dates and cancel date by dates when placing a purchase order, right? It should be clearly stated on your purchase order. And you know what? If you don't need those goods and they ship it after the cancel date, refuse it at the door if you don't need it, right? That's that's on the vendor. You've done your part and you've you know approached this correctly. So if they're shipping outside of that ship date and you don't need th that merchandise, um, just simply refuse it and then it's on them. I would say I would say a little caveat to that, um, Dane, is like if it's a vendor that you want to do business with again, you should probably receive it in and have a conversation with them because it puts you in the driver's seat. If you're if you're refusing orders nowadays, you, you, they don't like that because that, they just spent that UPS. And so they didn't have a time. They didn't have a chance to have a conversation. Now, if it's a vendor you've had problems with and you've communicated to them that we need to fix these problems and they still ship you, those are absolutely people that you you could, you know, you can bounce those deliveries. Uh, but I wouldn't do that on somebody that you want to have an ongoing relationship with. That's a phone call to say, hey, this stuff showed up two, two weeks late. I don't need it because then you get in the driver's seat. Like you don't need it, but if you could get it for 50 off, couldn't you probably use that? In for, couldn't you use those goods? So uh, that's why I would like to say is because it kind of puts you in the driver's seat too. Awesome. That, that mu Much better well said. See, that's why we have you on the panel, Doug, right? That's why I'm the moderator and you're the panelist. But okay, this is a great one. Kelly, I know this is your um, field because you are the queen of trend. What are some trends? We have an attendee asking, what are the trends out there. And Samantha, you're at market right now. So after Kelly, I'm going to want you to jump in. What's trending? What's hot? What's out there? Oh my gosh. I mean, that could be a whole panel within itself. <laughs> so first and foremost, um, when you sign up for our emails, you will get so much free trend content of what you would typically pay a forecasting service, a lot of money. So make sure that you sign up for our emails because you will get that content for free. And we also do at 10 a.m. on day one of Magic, a really great trend um, panel with Wendy Bendoni, who is a forecaster. So we'll give you all that for free. Right now on my Instagram, I actually have a recorded trend panel of what you should be shopping. So maybe I can put that in the notes here. Um, but at the end of the day, it's back to like black and a lot of neutrals and basics, although pink is still really big. So if you're looking, if you're a women's trend boutique, um, we're still seeing a lot of pinks as you see with Samantha. Uh, you need to definitely be having your denim wider still, less skinny, the better. Um, unfortunately, high-waisted isn't as popular as it was. I mean, we could go in like there's footwear trends, there's this trend, but we could go on for days. I will say, um, I'll make sure to send that link of some of the trends you need to be shopping. We're still seeing a lot of great accents with feathers, um, pops and neon. The maxi skirts are big. We're seeing denim skirts that, that are long. Um, a lot of 90s influences with cardigans that are kind of just have a couple buttons that are open for the younger demographic, um, cowboy boots, big still, a little bit less on the metallics and more on the neutrals. And a lot of playing with denim on denim. So don't think like, what is it, the Canadian suit? But um, yeah. 
Yeah. Tuxedo. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but people are definitely matching different denims or playing with cutouts uh, with, you know, overlays and frays and fringes and all the things. So I will put that um, where you can find my whole presentation. It's an Instagram live that will give it to you all. We go over colors. We go over pieces. We go over eras, patterns um, on all fronts, apparel, footwear. All right, awesome. Kelly, you could drop that link right in the chat if you want to. We could also send it up as a follow-up. Sam, what about you? Anything that you're seeing out on the floor that's getting you excited and, and revved up? Yes, yeah. That's what's always so fun at market is to walk and just look. Like you got to do those couple of laps the first time and say, okay, what am I seeing repeated over and over again? Uh, for sure, that double denim. Um, denim on denim, um, like Kelly mentioned, seeing that a lot. And then also, I think that matchy matchy where it's orange on orange, leather on leather, monochromatic all the way down. And a lot of that is being done in those neutrals that she mentioned. Um, something exciting I've seen too is a lot of lace. Um, so as we move into fall and winter, um, tights and pattern tights um, and the detail on those, um, that's going to be big. And we I haven't worn tights in a long time. So I'm excited that tights are going to be uh, coming back with that as well. And then color wise, as much as I love pink, I'm um, seeing a lot of fiery red. Um, so I think I'm going to have to change my lipstick color so I can wear the red, but it will be worth it because that color is just really beautiful. So um, I'm excited about what's coming out. I think there's, for a while, I felt like we saw a lot of the same over and over again. And now I think people are getting creative again and getting fresh. So um, it's going to be a good season for buying. Great. And Doug, I hear you look great in fiery red. So that's perfect. I was just going to make a comment about the, you need to make sure you keep that tights thing in mind, Dane. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Hey, good. I got you first. Uh, Doug, this is a, a great question for you. Um, we have someone that is asking, this is actually a really interesting way of thinking about it. Before attending a trade show, what's the best method to communicate with your customers to understand what their needs are and what type of products they're looking for? Do you send out a survey? Do you ask them on social media? I I, I have a great response for this, but I wonder what you, what you would say. Oh. I would say that, um, you know, the most vocal customer is typically not your customer. Um, I, I, what I would what I would do is kind of take a, a data uh, approach to that. I would look through your top 10 or 20 customers to see how much they visited you in the last six, uh, six months in the last year and see what they're buying because they're telling you what they want by what they bought, not what you, when you open... They don't know anything about market. They don't know anything about anything, right? That's why they come to you. Um, and that's why I've 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 encouraged quite a few people when I'm selling it at market, um, I'll say, have you ever posted something on Facebook and told your customer that or on Instagram and said, hey, I'm at market. What do you think of this? And I did that with a, a customer um, that I knew back in uh uh, in March at the collective in Chicago. And she ended up selling like, I don't know how many, these leather, ja these pleather jackets. I said, has your customer ever seen these? And she's like, no, I'm like, put it on Facebook and see what you think. She sold like eight or 10 of them by just that one posting that she put up by doing that. So that can be a really fun way to interact with your customers. Obviously you don't want to show them everything, but strategically, if you kind of wet their appetite and show them a couple of things, that could be a really fun way to engage with them. A great way to do that is on your stories, you can put a, you know, vote, right? Love this, I don't love it, right? And so that's a, Kelly was just, because, right? Like you have that great jacket and so maybe a little bit of a provocative piece or something a little different you put that up and let the customers vote. That's a fun way. But to, to double down on what Doug was saying, and you kind of hit exactly the point I was going to make is your customers are voting every day. They're, you're giving them a survey every day, and that's what they buy, right? It's right. in the data. So that is the best way. You're going to start seeing trends in purchasing history, uh, and that's actually going to be able to help you make future forecasting decisions. Um, this is another interesting question. Uh, I'm finding more and more vendors, and this is in the home and gift space, uh, are wanting to ship holiday merchandise as early, you know, early in July. Um, what's going on there? And I think that this 
kind of goes back to if anyone wants to jump in here about being just a little bit firm of what you need and what your expectations are, right? If you don't need that holiday merchandise in July, work with vendors that are going to accommodate what you need. But don't, I'm, but I'm, I'm sorry, but don't put yourself out there with something that you really want to say, I, I don't need that until November and take a chance that you're not going to get it in November because you didn't play a little bit of their game. So th th that can be, that can, that's, that's a conversation. That's something to build a relationship with. Um, if they want to ship it in July, you ought to get something for it. Um, uh, and so you just need to know that that's something you want to, you don't want to miss out on an opportunity because you didn't play their game. Yeah. And I kind of go back to Ashley Alderson's famous words, if you're not first, you're last. So think about mm. Target. Target's getting ready to put out their back to school stuff right now. We don't want to look at back to school, but it's in there and I see it and I'm going to feel like I better go ahead and buy those crayons and this notebook because it's here and I'm going to have a little FOMO as a consumer. So if you're getting holiday in July, think about Hobby Lobby when they put it out. You've got to have that before they even think about the fact that they need it. So a lot of times I'd say I don't feel like July is early at all for um, holiday for winter for all of that because as you build out those collections you're promoting on social media you're getting your customer ready you do need some of those things before they think they need them and before you think they need them um, so I, I don't feel like July is too early for holiday at all right and I think it's about planning and flow to that too so that you don't want to front load everything um, but maybe you start to tease some product and then flow it in throughout and right there's going to be different there there will be different platforms for buying right so maybe there's some fill-ins and immediates you could get through hub inventory or other online uh buying platforms you're pacing your bigger seasonal buys that maybe have to land a little earlier at market at a booth so there's going to be different um strategies to take uh make sure you get terms with um um um, um, we have someone that's saying, and this is a good point. No one, we, we haven't brought up, um, Greg Smith says, make sure you get terms if they ship in April. Uh, I'm mostly housewares and that's how I dealt with all this holiday shipping in July terms. That's something that we haven't talked about. And it's kind of like an old school thing now, but terms are like, uh, terms are a conversation that you should be having with vendors. You don't have to pay everything on a credit card, right? Terms are there for this exact reason. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg, right? They're there to help you beef up your inventory and still have a little bit of time to pay it off, right? So if you can get terms, if you could have that conversation with vendors, Doug, uh, Kelly, I don't know if you have any input there, but I still think it's an important conversation. Yeah, it's, ne it's never a bad idea to have a credit sheet that you have already filled out that you're carrying with you to market that has your bank reference that has three to six brands that you already work with. So you really want to add credibility. Um, we Everybody's gotten too demanding with the credit card and you need to start pushing back from that a little bit. If you only get 5% of your brands to give you terms, that's, that's something that's more than nothing. It's all about okay. cash flow. All right, so I think we have five minutes left in our, our scheduled time. So I, I wanna uh, start wrapping uh, things up. This was such a great conversation and Ula is on. So hi, Ula. Ula, uh, if you want more information about Faves, you can go to favespro.com. So thanks for being here, Ula. We did have two additional questions that were pretty complex. Uh, I don't think we'll get to answer it here. So if you have any questions, email me. You could contact us through the website and we'll be happy to either connect you to our panelist or answer it ourselves. So with the last five minutes, I'm going to do a little lightning round and ask some questions. Um, Samantha, uh, what do you think is the, your, what is your number one market tip for a successful market trip? I'm going to not say wear comfy shoes because it's not all about the shoes, although that is important. Um, it's planning ahead. You've got to do your homework before. Um, this is an inventory investment trip. Don't show up and just say, I'll just figure it out when I get there. Uh, make a plan before you go. Love that. Kelly. 
Okay, very similar. Um, so make sure you go onto the website of whatever market you're going to see all the different education panels that you would want to schedule. So I would make like a really clear schedule of appointments, um, certain brands you want to see, the panels you want to see, all the fun. Like there's so much like free fun drinks and DIY stations and take advantage of all that, right? Um, we have retailer swag bags that have up to $500 worth of product. And then make sure you section out the time to just walk the aisles and find new brands. So you're there to discover new. And then um, make the most bang for your buck, do the networking, ask the questions, and make sure you take advantage. For example, we have free shuttles to specific hotels. We have specific hotel uh, you know, prices that you can get for being a part of our block. So there's a lot of opportunity. All you have to do is ask the questions, do the research online, and we're here to help you. Thank you, Kelly. Doug? Be the first one in the door and the last one out. Okay. And I love that. And Dane, what's yours? Dane, what's yours? I know what mine is. What, no, know your closest bathroom at all times. <laughs> okay, that's that's a very good one. But I would say go with a budget. Oh, there have we a go. Plan, but specifically have a budget by, my, class, by category. Do you know anyone that could help a, a, a retailer out with that? Are there any resources out there? That you, you know, know there's this company called Management One. They're pretty good at that. Um, you might want to check them out. <laughs> I'll, I'll look into it for sure. All right. So listen, I know that Doug and Kelly both have hard stops at um, 2 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. So I think we're just, we'll wrap it here. Um, but I just want to say thank you, Kelly, Doug, Samantha, Dane. Um, I think this has been a really good conversation. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, at market. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. 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 And Mike, I'll just say one more uh, little shout out. Uh, if you need to register for Magic, make sure you're going. Ludacris will be there. And if you don't know about Hubventory, check out Hubventory. It's a great new tool. If you're not a member of Boutique Hub, we love our partners at the Boutique Hub and we love our friends at Informa. So we hope to see you at market in August. And thanks everyone for being here. Thank All you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.